Good morning. So we've reached the third Sunday of Advent called Gaudete Sunday, which means rejoice. And yet in 2020, during this Advent, there is not a lot of rejoicing happening right now due to some of the challenging times that we're living in. But I think these times during this particular Advent also call into question what in fact makes us happy. What do we really rejoice in in our lives? And rejoicing itself is a word that's worthy of taking a look at. It's a very interesting word. You can rejoice in something that you receive, an event that's happening, and I think most people when they think of rejoicing or happiness look at it from that perspective, but you can also rejoice in the anticipation of the gift that's coming or the event that's coming. And that anticipation can be every bit as exciting as the actual reception of the thing. And this is what Advent is really all about, both religiously and from a secular point of view. So if you think, for example, maybe the simplest understanding of it, the Christmas tree. Maybe some of you have the tree up. And as we begin to approach Christmas, we see the presents build underneath the tree. We have the blessing of the anticipation of what might be wrapped up for us each day until we receive the actual gift. Or maybe you think of pregnancy and the nine months waiting for the child. There's a joy in the anticipation of becoming parents. Now this in a massive way is what we have been doing as a human family for the last 2,020 Advents. Just think of the size of that number. It's been some time. We have been anticipating and continue to anticipate the arrival of the second coming of Christ. That's what this is all about. It recalls the anticipation of the first advent or coming, the incarnation of the Messiah himself, which ironically was also a 2,000 year time span. So from Abraham to the coming of Jesus is roughly two millennia. From Christ until now, two millennia. They were anticipating the same thing that basically we're waiting for. So in a very real way, now is exactly like then. And ironically, there's some similarities. It's been a very long time. They we're sort of at the end, they didn't know it, but the end of the Jewish kingdom. Things were not really what they should be. They were occupied by a pagan empire, Rome. They were subservient to that empire. The days of the high Jewish kingdom were gone. Well, paganism is everywhere. The church itself has been infiltrated by it, right? How many people are falling away? Don't go to church any longer. We, well, clearly in our modern day and age, we just simply obey whatever the government says. We are much more likely to just go with the flow than to be the catalyst of law. And we are anticipating, like every other generation that has come before us, a time that Jesus will return. So in retrospect, we are able to clearly see the fulfillment of the promises of his coming. I mean, we've been doing it for two millennia, rejoicing in it. But in our time, like theirs, we are waiting for a fulfillment. 
and discerning in the anticipation of what God is actually doing. Now that is difficult. We know that it's coming and that it will come. We anticipate the reception of the gift and the happening of the event. But discerning it, that's much more difficult. Like the tree, we look at its size and shape, the present underneath it, right? We pick it up and feel it, weigh it, maybe shake it to hear what might be inside. And putting all that information together, we might even be able to discern what the gift actually is. But we don't truly know until we open it on Christmas Eve or Christmas Day, whatever your tradition is. So it is with God. He has wrapped up the present in the scriptures and passed the package down through the generations. But there is always one generation that will get to receive and open the present, that will be there for the fullness of the unraveling of the event. And as we have seen in the past, the generation that has this blessing either gets it wrong or fails to see it because the unwrapping of the present is long delayed. We get bored and lose interest in the Christmas party. Or worse yet, we don't want anything to do with it. Such was the case with the coming of the Messiah. By the, fine, by the time he actually came, he was rejected. They didn't like what God was doing. They didn't want what God was doing. So what's the point? Well, there are several. First, there are many discernible signs that the gift is either being opened or about to be opened over the last century or so. But people, especially right now, are more concerned with getting back to normal life than they are with what God is doing. Just like the time of Christ and the Jewish kingdom so now, we would rather let God just let us keep on keeping on than change anything. Thank you, but no thank you. And on many levels, there's not even enough faith left for people to actually believe any of what has been biblically foretold to happen, that it might happen in the time that we're living in. Whether it be Matthew chapter 24, in which the Lord gives all of the signs of the great tribulation, the book of Isaiah and Jeremiah, the unfulfilled prophecies yet to come, or most especially the book of Revelation, that is nothing more than a fairy tale to people. I mean, just think about the events that have happened and humanity's response in the last century. Two global world wars that have killed more people than we have ever seen. Maybe more than all the wars combined before them. And yet in the wars combined before them, people turn back to God for peace. To a certain extent, we did in the 1900s. And then we began to fall away and we turned to weapons. Peace? It doesn't come from the hedge that God puts around a nation because they believe. Peace now comes from defiance and power. Nine eleven. Yeah, we turned back to God initially. Lasted a few months. And then it was, we will build back bigger and better. 
Prayer? Ha! Machinery, innovation, and a freedom tower to speak of our power. And then it should have had our attention for the first time since Christ. All of the masses in the world went dark and were not publicly celebrated for a time. That is something. And in many places, they're still locked down. The Blessed Virgin Mary, as the prophets of the past, has been appearing all over the world over the last century, many times approved by the church, warning us to repent and not trust in ourselves, but to return to the gospel and to Christ and his church. That's fallen upon deaf ears. And so subsequently man became enthroned in the place of God. And we've killed two billion children. Infanticide that cries out to God for justice. It is only by his divine mercy that nothing has happened yet. We have legalized gay marriage, another sin that cries out for justice to the Lord we have embraced. Not to mention the obscenities that we have unleashed on the world when we should have been a light set on the hill. I was reading an uh, article on Life Site News. On one site called Pornhub, there is over 500,000 years of video pornography. Meaning if you started watching, it would take you 500,000 years to get through it all. Just last year, 1.2 million hours more was uploaded. And over three billion hits a week. Think of the corruption that exists in the heart of humanity right now. And when in the last 50 years... Has there been any global or national movement in which our leaders, aside from maybe the one in the White House now, most recent, who played the Ave Maria at his convention, just spoke of thanking God for the coming of the Savior and the gift of God's Son. But outside of that, when have we heard anyone say, now is the time to repent and to leave these sins behind? Let us return to the church. Let us go to confession. Let us amend our evil ways. No. That is a sign in of itself. And if that were not enough, apparently the Christmas star will be reappearing this year next week. Or excuse me, the week after. Right before Christmas. So point one, these are interesting times. Second, we, whether people want to believe it or not, are waiting for the fulfillment of all of this. We are waiting for the fulfillment told by Christ and the prophets. This is what is mentioned in the gospel when the Pharisees are asking John, see, it's the underlying gird of it, why are they out there? These are the religious leaders. Why are they out there saying, who are you? And then they list some things, right? Because they, after two millennia, knew all of the signs, and all of a sudden this man comes out of nowhere, and they're like, okay, what's going on? Are you the Christ? 
No. Are you the prophet? Moses said that a day would come when he would raise up a prophet like himself that would be the final one. Are you him? No. Are you Elijah? Now that one's real interesting. Why? Because Elijah rode up to heaven in a fiery chariot and never died. Just like Enoch in the Old Testament in Genesis, it said he was taken up after he'd lived 360 years. And the tradition was that these two had never died. And so Isaiah says, before the Lord comes to strike the land with doom, Elijah will return in order to reconcile Israel to itself. So they were awaiting him. Was John him? Well, Christ says, if you're willing to expect it, he certainly had his spirit. But in fact, Elijah would come before the end. Why? Because Revelation says that there were two witnesses that will be coming. They prophesy against the beast, the Antichrist, the false prophet. And then they're killed and they lay in the streets for three and a half days before the Holy Spirit blows the breath of life back into them and they ascend into heaven for all the world to see. Israel did not understand that there would be two comings, first the incarnation and then the coming in glory. And Elijah, in fact, will indeed come. But maybe the most interesting part of it all is that they didn't know who John was. He says what? I am the voice of one crying out in the desert, make straight the way of the Lord. Little did anyone know that that little piece of scripture wasn't just a saying, it referred to a someone. Someone that they didn't know was even coming. And so it tells us how hard it is to understand what God is doing. The greatest prophet of the Old Testament and the end of the prophets and the herald of the New Testament wasn't even known. How many more things in Christ's teaching or in the prophets of the Old Testament are there that are coming that we don't even understand? Especially in a generation that could care less and isn't looking for them. And yet, like them, it might be all in front of our face. We just can't see it. Such is the case of our times. Finally, and very simply, Advent is a reminder to rejoice in what is coming. And a warning not to get too locked into the comfort of this life. If we have seen anything in the past however many months it's been with this virus, it's that how easily the comfort and the ease of the life that we had can be taken away. And chaos reigns. Instability is our new norm. And the general sense of the faithful that nothing will be turning back to normal anytime soon, if ever. So we don't rejoice in the world or in this life, but we rejoice in the gifts that are to come, that are far beyond anything that we're experiencing now. This is just a little stop along the way that we have to endure. So how do we do it? Well, we do it by admitting to ourselves in the time that we are living in that in fact these times are coming and we may in fact be living in them like every other Christian generation has. Nobody knows when that time will be, but we keep our eyes open and we're vigilant. How many times has Christ said in the scriptures, be vigilant, stay awake, you do not know the day or the hour. Keep your lamps lit for you do not know when he will come. It may be the third or the second or the first watch. Blessed is he who is awake when the Lord returns because it will come like a thief in the night. Put all together, it tells you that it will be a time of utter darkness. Right? He himself says, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? And so we need to be vigilant 
And we do it by remaining in the ark of the church, which means that we continue to come to regular confession and we repent if we have sin in our life. What is the evil in your life right here today that you know very well Jesus wants out of it? Are we still going to confession? This time of the virus has taken its toll on the faith of the faithful. Have we fallen away from an old zealous approach to the way we practice our faith? Have we become mediocre? That is not vigilance. Times like this call for zeal and fire and fervor. And so as we continue toward Christmas, I will leave you just with three questions of discernment to consider. First, do you rejoice in Christ above all things, in your faith? Is it front and center in your life? Is the greatest fear in your life displeasing God? Or have you rejoiced in other things that maybe now have been taken away? Or aren't what they used to be? Have they failed you? Your faith in Jesus is the only thing that no one can take from you but you. And it is the most precious thing in your life. Second, are you spiritually prepared right now if this is the generation of the tribulation? It's worth considering. That time is not a fairy tale. It will be a generation's time. And it may be ours. Can you imagine the faith that it will take to survive it? Are you ready? Or are you asleep? Is your faith asleep? And finally, is, what is the Lord calling you to repent from? Whatever it is, before Christmas, and we've got a, there's no penance services this year, but we've got tons of confession times, resolve to make a good confession, maybe even a general confession of your life. Because we never not, quite know the time that we're living in or how the whole thing will play out. But we do have control of our spiritual life. It's ours and only ours. And I promise you, now, like never before, is the time to get your soul in order.